So, hello and welcome. My name is Mark Simos. Nicholas Decola. And we are both uh, cybersecurity architects on Microsoft's cybersecurity team. Um, so we focus, uh, we are in the services organization, so we focus on working with customers um, directly and, uh, and consulting engagements uh, primarily to help them secure against various different cybersecurity attacks, um, including pass the hash, credential theft in its various forms. And I've also uh, had the honor and privilege of uh, co-authoring the Pass the Hash white paper. Um, there's uh, the current one that's out there, as well as we're working on an upcoming version, which uh, Mark Rasinovich mentioned in the other session. Um, so one, one note before we start, if you can go to the mics if you're going to ask a question, please feel free to ask a question any time during the presentation. Um, if you're stuck in the middle, because I know these seats are kind of hard to get out of, uh, we'll try to repeat the question so everybody can hear it, because um, they are recording it so other folks can, can see it live or, or watch it later. So, our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about our cybersecurity team here at Microsoft um, and kind of the things that we do. What, what we classify as a determined adversary and what the targeted attacks look like um, that we're seeing with customers. What is past the hash or credential theft? So this will be a little bit of reiteration of what Mark did in his session. So if you didn't see it, great. If you did see it, it's, it uh, it'll be a rehash of that. And then last, some things you can do and credential theft mitigation architectures in your environments to protect against this, right? And things that we've been helping customers implement um, to actually protect against credential theft. And, and the way to look at these architectures is they're really a reference architecture that we've had to develop based on the information that we get from our incident response teams and what's actually happening on the customer hacks. So it's very much a reference architecture that was built in response to the attacks we're seeing. And we do have a, a pretty cool demo of, it, of the tools actually uh, using past the hash. So a little bit about our team, uh, just real quick. Our team uh, is really focused on going out and helping customers uh, through services engagements and delivering all kinds of different things. So the big areas we've kind of focused in are up here on the slide. So sensors and intelligence, how do we detect threats within the network uh, that you have today? And then we take what we learn from that and help customers when we do an inc uh, incident response. So we've had a lot of customers that have been compromised that call us in and say, hey, I'm a 90% Windows shop. How, do you, how can I respond to this compromise? What, what's the best practice? So we help them work through all that recovery um, and mitigation. And then we take all those lessons learned from those first two and kind of what can we do to help customers mitigate these current threats, right? So today it's past the hash is one of the big ones, right? Application vulnerabilities, um, things like that. But in the future, that's going to change, and we're probably going to change what we come up with and architectures that we deliver as more people adapt to these things and the attackers have to move on to something else, right? Um, typical helping customers with architecture and advisory um, and SDL, how do they implement SDL and protect their applications that they're developing in-house, um, as well as uh, we have a lot of technology experts that came from the product group on working on things like uh, direct access, MBAM, and BitLocker, and a lot of those built-in kind of out-of-the-box features, security features of Windows. Yep. And the only thing I would add there is that we do actually have on-site incident response teams, and that's where we get a lot of our intelligence on what's happening on the attacks, is we do help our customers when they do have a compromise or an attack underway. Um, so that's, that's primarily the source of where we uh, develop the requirements for this architecture. Yeah, so as Mark said with our team, th these are the kind of trends that we're seeing and the learnings that we see in the incident response, right? It's, it's super easy. Uh, to, to get an attack in, and once you're in, use this past the hash credential theft to quickly escalate or laterally traverse across the network in a lot of the Microsoft architectures that are out there today. So as an attacker, if I can just get one, one beachhead into your network, then I can just use this technique, and it's very easy. The tools are readily available. The source code's readily available. They can package that up and put it in their own toolkits and do this very easily, right? So we want to help customers stop credential theft um, and mitigate it in their architecture so that the attackers have to use something else. So they have to step up their game and go to that next level. Um, what we found is, and this is obvious uh, to anybody if you're in the security realm and you're in this room because you're in the security realm, the adversary has grown in maturity tremendously, right? These aren't kids in their basement anymore writing denial of service scripts. Um, these are actual funded organizations that have full-time employees doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, right? That's what they do for their job every day. Meanwhile, we come in for eight hours a day and try to combat them, right? Um, and pretty much in every incident response that we've seen, there has been some use of credential theft. 
almost every time. Very, very one or two cases where we didn't actually see that. But once they've come in and that, that way either works through some type of spearfish or they find an application uh, zero day that they get in, but once they're in, pass the hash. That's the way they go. Um, and typically what the attacks look like once we start doing our investigation is they typically get in, they go after Active Directory as fast as possible, right? Because if I own Active Directory, I own all your passwords, I own all your user accounts, I can gain access to anything. They typically drop some malware on the hosts, um, and we have seen in some cases where they've actually tested their malware against the customer's AV signature sets and different tools that the customer has, IDS, IPS. Um, so they actually had notes in there saying, yep, tested against signature set from McAfee at this date. Um, so they knew that it would work in the customer environment. And then typically, 99% of the time, they try to basically exfil data from that customer. That's their goal, get as much data as possible. Um, we have seen in less than 1% of cases uh, what we like to call the wrecking ball, right? They've actually come in and maliciously uh, wiped computers, um, like they talked about in Mark's session, Saudi Aramco. Um, we've had a, a couple other customers that their SAN just started deleting files while they were on the network working. So, uh, and that's kind of how they found out as the SAN was being wiped. Yep, and we've also seen a lot of extremely sophisticated indicators of organization. Um, some of our colleagues uh, observed in one case they actually saw a bunch of computers with very high processor usage. They looked at them, it was about 10, 12 computers, and they dug through and dug through and dug through and figured out what was going on. There was a, they were cracking password hashes. They looked a little closer and they were actually cracking the same password hash. And so it, it took a little bit of a moment, but they finally figured out they were actually conducting a class on their network. The attackers were teaching other attackers using their network as a lab. This stuff really happens. This is a sophisticated, organized type of uh, situation that we're in. Yeah. Why, why buy your own development resources uh, when you can just use someone else's? Private cloud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> different cloud, diff different owner, but yeah, and it's free. Um, so one of the things that we typically see, um, probably the biggest thing and the easiest way we can relate this is kind of the castle uh, scenario is kind of the way I think of it. In traditional network architectures, we've treated our networks like, our, like a castle, right? I have a moat, I have a wall, which is my IPS, my firewall, my IDS, all these things kind of on the outside. But inside my network, it's just kind of one big flat network. And I'm not talking IP space, VLANs, those type of things, but from a perspective of a user, I can just reach out and touch a share. You know, not a lot of customers do IPsec or network segmentation. They may have line of business applications that they, they break off into a separate area and protect that way. Um, but typically in most Windows environments, what we see is customers just have kind of one big flat Windows architecture, right? Maybe a couple domains, maybe one forest um, with those domains. And typically when they do that, they treat a lot of resources equally, right? They don't say, well, this is my line of business application that runs our business, and we're gonna put a higher security baseline on that than we may on these other systems. We typically have one baseline that we use across all those systems, right? And that includes the same systems that the administrators are using, right? Their workstations that they log into, that they check email on, that they open MMC and do management of the different servers or services on their network. And so um, typically it's what we've seen in most networks. So what we wanna to try to do is help customers get past that castle, castle wall mentality and think about putting some interior walls and doors inside their network where they can protect against things, especially around credential theft. And especially as you look at the kind of four Gartner mega trends with the social, mobile, um, analytics, and uh, cloud, all those pieces are contributing to essentially the erosion of that uh, perimeter because the re corporate resources are going outside of the traditional corporate land boundary. And at the same time, you know, the attackers are getting adept at coming in and compromising any given workstation through phishing attacks and the like. And so that perimeter is really, really um, it's a part of a security strategy, but it is no longer the primary and only part of the security strategy. So, so we got some more swag if somebody can answer this question. Typically, and, and this is based on our experience with incident response, how many hours does it take to get domain admin after somebody establishes a beachhead, an attacker establishes a beachhead? I saw his hand first. Nope. Nope. On average, across all the attacks in a real enterprise network? Nope. I'll tell you it's higher, a little higher. Higher, higher, higher. He's getting closer. No. A little higher. What was that? 
No. 48, there it is. Yep. 48 hours. Uh, I'm glad you guys thought it was a lot faster. That's uh, awesome. Um, we, did, we have seen some cases where they typically, uh, doesn't happen that way where they go right into the domain administrator, but typically they target someone that's not there, but they can gain access to domain administrator credentials in typically 48 to 72 hours in most of the incidents response that we do. When we do the forensics and look at the logs, we can see that occur that fast. And pen testers, you know, can do it in as fast as five or six. We have much better data there than having to crawl through the logs. So this is uh, this picture here is Mark. Um, mm -hmm. This is what he does on the weekends. But um, this is kind of what past the hash looks like in a nice animated graphic, right? The attacker targets a workstation or a set of workstations. Um, typically, it's not in mass anymore, but in mass to a certain number of users within the organization. Um, and once he sends that in, he gets a foothold on one of those boxes, um, and hopefully that box is someone that has local admin, right? And they compromise that box and harvest that user's credentials, and they use those credentials to actually move to another box on the network. So before we go on, I'd like everybody to close their eyes, because I don't want anybody to see who else is vulnerable. <laughs> And raise your hand if you are using the same admin password across all your workstations. Okay. Thank you. By the way, it was about half, but don't point anybody <laughs> out. I'll, I'll point you now. I'm just kidding. Um, so typically they move across, across to the next machine, harvest some more credentials. Next machine, oh wait, there's a domain admin on that box or some higher level admin, right? And now he has those creds and boom. Domain admin own, owns everything on your network, right? Once they have that domain admin hash, they can act as a domain admin wherever they want on the network. And this is a shared state of control. They have the, they have the password effectively or the password hash of the domain admin, which has direct or indirect control over all resources. It doesn't prevent the legitimate admins from controlling them, but it's a shared state of control when they have stolen the credentials. So this, this diagram is pretty complex, um, but we w the whole point we drew this out was we wanted to show how many different paths there were to pass the hash, right? To use pass the hash to gain domain admin credentials, right? If I can establish a beachhead as a user and I can get a hold of uh, a box on the network, I could use a vulnerability to e escalate to another box on the network, a server level, a workstation admin, or I could cause some problems and get that user to call the workstation admin and log into the box. Now I have workstation admin creds. And you can see how this can quickly spread, and they can basically do some things to actually force people to get the credentials they want, right? Very simple. And the one thing I want to add here, when you think about a traditional vulnerability, and a vulnerability is just the opportunity for an attacker to have unauthorized control. So when you think of a traditional vulnerability that you issue a patch for, it's a mistake in code, or potentially it's a mistake in the configuration of the system because you know, a, a certain NTLM setting wasn't set high enough so landman authentication is available and, and vulnerable, et cetera. The interesting thing about the pass the hash piece is it's a vulnerability or a potential for an attacker to gain control by virtue of how the network is operated, not how the code functions, not how it's configured in sort of that long-term static configuration but it's how it's operated, the decisions that an admin makes on a day-to-day -day basis, where they decide to log on, how they use that, all of those contribute to the attack surface for past the hash and credential theft. So keep that in mind is that ultimately this is something that the, the attack surface is shaped by the admin's practices. So keep that in mind. So now we'll, we'll demo it, Mark will demo it on his laptop here. Um, we basically have a simple domain with a DC and a client. Um, and a domain admin and uh, an attack operator role. Yep. So this is the, what I like to call the um, unsuspecting domain admin uh, story for past the hash. What we've got is that very simple domain. I'm gonna log in with a local account. So this is simulating malware that is uh, logged in and authenticating as the system level. So no permissions on the domain, just simply has control of that one machine. So we're gonna go ahead and do a quick net use to the domain controller, and we get prompted for credentials. We've got nothing, I have no access to it. I'm just a local account on this local machine. So now as the attacker, because I'm in the attacker persona right now, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my hacker tools. So I have some pass the hash tools here. And I'm gonna run a WCE. You guys have probably seen this in a number of other sessions. 
This scrapes all of the credentials that are in LSS process memory. Anything that is running a Windows process on this box, whether it's a service, a batch job at the time that was running, a local session, a run as session, anything that is running a process as a user has those single sign-on creds sitting there in case that process needs to reach out to a share, to exchange, to a SharePoint, et cetera. Anything running a process will have those creds there. When I look at this as an attacker, I don't see anything that's particularly interesting. I've got the account I'm running under, which doesn't gain me anything, and the machine account. The machine account I might use because I want to be stealthy and do some Active Directory reads as the machine. No one's going to look in the logs for a machine account reading data in Active Directory. Um, they're not going to pay that much attention to it. But otherwise, no real escalation of privilege. So I'll run WCE-E. Same thing, just sits there and waits for the credential for another logon to happen. As soon as a logon event happens, rescrapes memory, sees if there's any new credentials there. Now I'm going to switch users to a completely different session, and I am going to now log on as the unsuspecting domain admin. I do not know that this machine is compromised. I am simply logging on to this workstation, not knowing it's compromised. And I've learned to stop talking when I type. I type much better that way. My domain is owned. It's gone. Doesn't look like it, doesn't feel like it, doesn't smell like it. There is no indication. I'm just going to do my job. Just the fact that I logged into that machine means my domain is owned. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back over. And the reason that I show that particular uh, demo there with the, with the unsuspecting admin is because you can also have a keylogger installed that could do the same thing. Owning the machine and entrusting that machine, that workstation, with those credentials means you have to trust that workstation with those credentials. So from the attacker's point of view, I now have the domain admin creds, do a WCE-S to change my copy of my creds and overwrite them with the domain admins. And now, when I go to net use to the DC, and I'm going to go for broke. I'm going to map a drive to the C dollar sign so I can install some tools to dump the Active Directory database. Good to go. I'm on Z. I'm going to make some hack tools. And as you can see on my DC, everything I'm doing is happening in real time. And the domain admin, unless they're looking for that activity, unless they're looking at the logs, does not know that's happening. And by the way, when you go look in the logs, it looks just like domain admin made, it, made that directory. Yep. Right? So it looks like an insider. Very, very tough to detect. And then prior to Windows 8.1 and prior to the update that was just released, it was either yesterday or today, um, running, oops, let me switch back to C drive here. This was pioneered by Mimikatz and also added to WC afterwards. The reversible, the plain text equivalent um, that are uh, plain text passwords encrypted in a reversible way are also theftable from that perspective. And of course, the last thing I like to show is you can also dump the local SAM database and use a local administrator and thash there as well. So just to kind of give you a sense of the things that we're up against and the things that we're defending against. Two, one, one. There we go. Is it my turn or your turn? I think that one's fine, yeah. So first thing that a lot of people ask, and I do want to ask a question. You know, this doesn't have to be private. How many people are using smart cards or another form of multi-factor authentication? Good. Doesn't defend you against this because, sorry, it, the, there, in order to maintain compatibility with NTLM and with Kerberos, there are NT hashes and Kerberos tickets in the LSAS process so that you can access Exchange, access SharePoint, access a file share, access any given line of business application that's, that's uh, integrated with Active Directory. It is protocol compatible, so therefore, all of the secrets that give you that protocol compatibility have to be there. In the case of NTLM, for example, if the user does have a password, you know, someone has gone in and reset the password after the user um, was smart card enabled, or they're just simply not smart card enforced, it's the user password hash. It's an actual hash of the password. 
if you have clicked that box there for the smart card attribute on the account to require it for interactive logon, it's a random 128-bit value. There may or may not be a password that actually generates that hash value. But in each case, it is there, it's theftable, and it's reusable. And it's never rotated. Correct, in the current product versions. The other thing is, is that attribute on the account restricts only interactive logon. It does not require a smart card to be present for a network logon or a batch or service or any of the logon types, only an interactive. Interactive is a logon locally or a logon over RDP. So that's the only places that it can require a smart card to be present. And the other thing is, is assuming all these things were magically solved, when it comes down to it, if you have a smart card sitting in a reader and you type the pin into the keyboard and the attacker has standard issue malware today, which will key log the pin, they can then simply run run as slash smart card or net use slash smart card and use that smart card with the pin. So the trust and the integrity of the host where you're doing this admin work is paramount. Make sense? So the next question is, what can we do about it? There's two points of interception for the credential theft and reuse of the attack. The first is credential theft. If the credential is not there, smart card's never inserted, the password is never typed, if the credential is simply not there, it cannot be stolen. So if you make sure that your high privilege, high value accounts, much like mitigation one of the past the hash white paper, are not on low privilege servers or lower trust servers or higher risk servers or workstations, such as an internet browsing workstation, it can't be stolen from there. It's simply not there to be stolen. The second piece is credential reuse. If something can or is likely to be stolen, such as the local admin password of a given workstation, then you plan for that to be stolen and you make sure that the admin password is different across all the workstations or it doesn't have the logon rights it needs to go from one to another with those credentials that can be stolen there. So those are your two approaches that you have to build a foundation, a strategy, and an architecture on. Make sense? So the way we pull all this together is, like Nicholas said, we have two different forms of it. Privilege escalation, which can happen through credential theft. It can happen through application agents, which is a form of control. So if I have an SCCM server or a LAN desk or any other type of configuration management, op operations management server, I can send a command down and have it run as system on those managed machines. So through credential theft, through application agents and through any service accounts that are there. Service accounts and domain admins, in case anyone's wondering, very, very bad idea. Terrible idea. The idea is we need to set up this tier system. And you make sure that nothing on a lower tier can control a higher tier. If an account that controls the higher tier, like a domain admins, logs on to a server or a normal internet browsing workstation, you have granted control of that workstation of the whole domain. Make sense? Same thing as if you have an SCCM server that has an agent on a DC, that SCCM server has control of the domain and everything in it. Same thing with Ops Manager server, LAN desk, Tivoli, you name it, the whole deal. So privilege escalation, you make sure that you have separated to tiers so that if anyone knocks over any of these resources, they cannot get to a higher level of privilege. And that's just workstation servers and domain controllers roughly for the tier one, tier two, and uh, tier zero. Lateral traversal. We also wanna make sure if someone knocks over any given workstation, they do not get every other workstation. If they knock over any given server, they do not get every other server. And so that's accomplished through essentially those mitigations two and three in the white paper, that the local accounts that are there, as well as the, um, the domain accounts that are used to manage them, are also not able to be reused and stolen and used to compromise the rest of the tier. So the way that we look at this tier from a, a logon restriction perspective is same tier logon, so you designate your accounts, you designate your computers as one of those tiers, and same tier logon is allowed. It's good, doesn't harm anything. Logging onto a, a higher level tier, 
The defaults in Windows don't let anyone log on to a domain controller, so that's pretty well set. Most people don't let their standard issue users or their help desk people log on to their servers, so that's usually kind of taken care of in most cases. It's also not allowed, but it's usually taken care of already. The thing that's different is you don't want the higher tiers, the more powerful ones, to log on to the lower tiers. Cool? So I, we got some more sunglasses here. Uh, I, ha I have to get rid of all of them before the, uh, the presentation is over. So whoever can ask one good question, I'll give you a set of sunglasses. Uh, like, there we go. What about terminal servers? Uh, in the sense of? So that, that's where we talk about the tiers, right? So if that terminal server has internet access and can be compromised with malware, or even from the end user workstation is compromised with, with malware and they can pass it through that terminal service session, and your servers are, or your admins are logging into there, then your admins are compromised just as much as your users, right? Most, so you, yeah, most of the time we classify them as tier two because they're like a user desktop, they just happen to be using a server OS. Yeah. So if, you, if you're gonna have a terminal server that admins can log into and run admin tools, it should be moved up into that blue tier with all the servers, and then if you're gonna have one separately for the users, move, move down in the gray tier with your, your servers, or your workstations, I'm sorry. Yes? Yep, yep. So yes and no. Uh, yes, there, there's a case question? for a VM, but we'll talk about it in a, in a couple minutes. I think we'll answer your question about uh, we actually want to reverse that where your admin workstation and you have a user, user VM, but we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep, I'm sorry. He asked, uh, what about having dedicated admin VM uh, on top of a user workstation to provide that segregation to your admin? Um, so we actually recommend the reverse where you have a dedicated admin workstation and a user VM for your user workspace that connects to the internet. Yes? How much time we got? We got plenty of time. Okay. Thank you for using the mic. On. There you go. Okay. Um, how vulnerable would, uh, for those of us who might have a unfortunate service account that has a domain admin privilege, how vulnerable are service accounts running on each machine? Would they be just as easily to dump their credentials? Or uh, does that remain in memory as well? So well, it depends on the logon of that service account, right? So mm -hmm. if that service account is reaching out um, to another machine and it's only doing a network logon, then no credentials are exposed in memory. Okay. But if it actually opens a session on that machine to run some process, session, yeah. bang, it's gone. Same with like batch and everything too, I'm guessing. Yeah. 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 All right. Great. So, oh, question? So the question is, um, like a, a one-time password type approach, like an RSA token, does, is that the same? Uh, the answer is once you have a Windows session, you're going to have the credentials to use NTLM as well as to use Kerberos. So you can either, uh, an attacker could either leverage that or they could also simply just leverage the process itself and do some essentially process injection techniques. Um, if they are our system there. So there's a number of different ways that they could do it. The easiest and the ones that the tools are the most mature is around credential theft. But once they have a valid win Windows logon session, they're authenticated, they're in, they've got the, the, um, the credentials that are there for the, for the user's use. Not in memory, your hash is still in memory. The so once you log on with that one-time password, it's no different than putting a smart card in and then pulling it right back out, assuming it doesn't force you to log off or lock. Um, that your, your logon session in memory has your hash. So I could just take it after that, right? Yeah. One more and then, and then we wanna keep going. I saw his hand up there. Uh, Does RDP from an admin workstation to a non-admin workstation? Uh, if you use restricted admin mode, 
in 8.1 and 2012 R2, which is uh, being backported uh, as we speak. Yep, it's, it's, and the measure of that is always what credentials are exposed to the remote end. So remote admin mode is one way to prevent them from being there, simply only using a user account when you RDP to a user terminal server or user RDP server would also do it. As long as you're not exposing the admin cred to that remote untrusted point, that's the key. So what, one thing to think about with uh, that, that kind of case right there where you're using RDP to like user workstations, right? That's where your thread is, that's where they're connecting to the internet, that's where they're hitting all the sites that are embedded with malware. Um, there's a lot of other tools out there, for example, like Link or using remote assistance inside of Windows that can give you that remote desktop feature to your help desk admins, but doesn't actually expose credentials on the end user workstation. Yes. So, so the question was, if I open a tool using run as, does that expose my credentials? Yes, the answer is yes. So one of the things we did, uh, Mark did, did a lot of this work, um, to one, issue the pass the hash white paper from Microsoft, right? So things customers can do today in their networks to help mitigate against this. Um, but one of the things we looked at is we still think kind of the key, especially around admins and domain admins, is really about uh, the protection of that admin workstation, you know, things like known good media, things like ensuring it can't talk to the internet. Um, so we went kind of a step further above and beyond and came up with what we call the enhanced security admin environment. And so this architecture is really about partitioning the domain admins and enterprise admin credentials out into a separate uh, admin forest or red forest as we call it, um, so that that environment is built with known good media pulled down from the vendor, not a custom image that typically the customers have, because um, we have seen attackers drop malware inside of a WIM image. Uh, it's very easy to do. It's not that hard nowadays. The tools are built into Windows. Um, and then we wrap the whole thing in IPsec and only allow communications out from that environment to what needs to be allowed, right? So you can't talk to the internet from your admin workstation. You can't look at Facebook. You can't go to Gmail. You can't do any of those things. Um, but you can open an MMC and connect to the production domain and manage your production domain from this secure, hardened environment, right? Um, so we, we provide hardened workstations, right? All the Microsoft baselines, app locker running on the boxes, um, the users that are using those admin workstations who are production domain admins are actually just users of that forest. They're not even domain admins of the red forest, right? So we move them over, like I was just saying. Um, we add in some management and monitoring. One of the key things we try to do was keep this environment small. Customers don't need another environment to manage. Um, so we typically run it at a couple DCs, maybe at a couple sites, um, and we auto patch with WSUS so that you don't have to kind of do those things just automatically there. Um, but one of the key things we did with this is we wrote a custom operations manager security pack, right? And we monitor the production domain controllers for key indicators of cyber attacks, right? Somebody changed an authentication package on a domain controller, right? Why would somebody do that? That shouldn't happen ever. Um, somebody added people to domain admins accounts, and they shouldn't be doing that unless there's an approved request, right? So we create, create those alerts from inside that environment. Um, and it's a dedicated environment so that um, attackers can't own, you know, operations manager and just block the alerts from being created. Um, we take those domain admins of the Red Force, we call them Red Card admins, and the production built-in administrator accounts, and we make them what we call break glass accounts. Put them in a safe, and it should be two-person integrity to go get those, because you shouldn't really need to use those accounts ever, because of delegation and the rights that your user accounts have, or your gold card accounts on this. And then as part of it, we typically help customers implement those lateral traversal mitigations um, in their network in the production domains that they have today. Yep. And the, the, for those of you that are paying attention, this is very much when we were writing. That was probably the very, very bad introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's laughing now, so that's good. Hey, hey we're, all, we're friendly here. Um, 
So mitigation one in the white paper was very much built on this architecture. This architecture actually preceded mitigation one of, the, of, of it, and when we built the, the white paper, we asked ourselves, what could anybody do today without going to this extreme? This is the industrial grade. This is the you know, plan for a long period of time, and we don't have to worry about it because it's so hard for the admins to create risk that we don't have to worry about that, and we can move on to other problems. That's really the intent of this architecture. And you'll see that it's very much reflect, reflected in mitigation one of the white paper, which is the what can I do today with the stuff in my hands, the skills I've got. Um, the IPsec isolation on this and a number of the other technologies makes this a, a bit challenging to deploy. Um, but it is uh, really that least privilege enforced at the uh, account privilege level, at the network connectivity level. It, is, it takes all of those security practices and principles to the extreme because of the value of the domain admins and the enterprise admins and, and the, the control they have over the corporate assets. Yes, sir. If you could use the mic, please. I know it's hard. Hey, guys. So once you put all these controls in place, uh, obviously, in every environment, you have probably from five to 10 agents running on domain controls. So even if you have put all these controls in place, all the infrastructures that using those agents on domain controls can be used to compromise those domain controls. How yes. would you? So one of the things we've been, we've been talking to customers about is, uh, and we talk about this a little later, is application and service hardening, right? Look at what's on those domain controllers and determine, could you possibly go some other route? So for example, we've had a customer, they just stopped patching their domain controllers with SCCM, right? Because it's such a key role in the, in the forest and they have a dedicated WSUS box just to patch their domain controllers, right? So taking some of those off there, and I know things like antivirus and all that have to be managed. You know, maybe there's a different way to do it. Maybe there's a way, we actually worked with a customer that said, oh, I have, I have McAfee EPO, and I need full domain admin rights so I can do whatever I want with EPO. And what we did, actually worked through it, was found out they don't need full domain admin rights. They actually need uh, nothing and they can manage their system by deploying the agent as part of the built-in image, right? So once that agent is on there, it's all done through local system. So, you know. But so, so the point is maybe there's some mitigation needs to take place where you yes. teach the vendors not to run under domain or admin credentials on domain controls. Yep, yep. yep. And we, we are actively working on that. Um, we, we have kind of the, the really talented, experienced, skilled people, and we're trying to pull the methodology out so that we can work on publishing that of how we go through that hardening process so it's a repeatable process. But kind of right now, we're kind of doing it based on raw experience, and we're working on documenting that. Okay. That includes system center components, right? <laughs> yes, we, we pick on SCCM a lot. They do the same thing. OK, thanks. So. Yeah. Uh, let me get him. Go ahead. Yeah, so the question was, how does WCE get access to the hashes in the operating system if there's no vulnerability? Uh, because we need to be able to do the same thing, right? We need to be able to create a network packet with your hash in it so that you can log on to a server. So we have APIs, obviously unpublished, so that we can do these things. They just figured them out. So they're not using a vulnerability. They're using something that's native in the OS that's there for us to be able to operate so that you don't get prompted for your password 25 times a day. And, and that raises a very critical point. To start past the hash on that first workstation, you have to have administrator privileges, which is equivalent to system access. You have to be able to operate at the level of the operating system and work within system processes in order to exploit the, uh, excuse, excuse me, to extract the hashes. And so, you know, it's a simple immutable law of security that if you control the machine, you control everything on it, all the secrets, all the keystrokes, all the things it can do. And you know, by getting that system or administrator level of it, um, that's how they do it. So let me ask another quick question of the crowd here. How many people here allow their normal users, not on an exception basis, but their normal users to run, in general, as a local administrator when they browse the web and do email and such? Whoa. OK. <laughs> that, doing that, running your users with local administrator privileges, it allows them to get off your back because they don't bug you to install software. <laughs> but what it also does is it allows an attacker to only have to break out of the application controls to start past the hash. 
They can convince the user to click yes on the gold bar. They're admin, they're rolling. They you know, find some minor vulnerability in any given you know, web browser plugin or app, and they can get out of that browser or that email app and then start running. They only have to convince the user to do something uh, to do it. If you run your users as a standard user without local administrator privileges, they have to come up with an elevation of privilege. They have to find some way to get from standard user to, to administrator on that box. So if you want to put a security boundary between the wrong click and this attack starting, you want to make sure you're running your users as standard users. So we're going to try to make these questions quick because I just looked at the time and we're getting low. I think we looked at PowerShell, and I thought it was, if you did WinRM, I think it exposes their credentials. I don't, I don't remember I offhand. Depending, uh, you're talking about a remote connection with PowerShell. Let me make sure I understand the question. If you're using PowerShell to do remote commands on a box, are you exposing the credentials in the far end? So, so depending on the method and the tool, we, ha we built a table in the first pass of the hash white paper um, that's out there, it's public on the web. There's a table of I think around 10, 12, 20 different tools, remote administration tools, methods, PowerShell, and all these uh, things, depending on the switches in PowerShell, if I recall correctly, it will or won't expose a credential. And so I, I think that's probably the best reference to go to because we went through and tested all of those and documented which ones do expose credentials, which ones don't. Yes, sir. So we, uh, the question was, if I randomize all my local administrator passwords, how do I go back and get on that box when it can't connect to the domain? Um, or when it's an offline, how do I log in as a local administrator? Uh, so there's two ways, right? We've seen customers, A, that don't care. They just wipe the box and reload it. Box is broke, no problem. Wipe and reload, done, problem solved. Um, user logs back in, they pull all their data down, and they keep going. Uh, the other way you can do it is there are tools available. We have a, a tool that's publicly available uh, and free um, that you can basically randomize that password and it's stored in a confidential attribute in AD, and then an administrator or delegated administrator uses a web interface, they can go pull that administrator password. Um, and there, there's other tools, uh, companies like Leapsoft, CyberArk, uh, they have those tools to vault those passwords into some type of vault where you can go pull them out. So, kind of a couple yeah. different ways. I'm sorry? Uh, good question. I the call it the Jiri tool. Yeah. Um, the tool, uh, it was written by a gentleman named Yuri Formacek. He, it's actually linked in the first pass the hash white paper in that uh, mitigation recommendation. Yeah, I don't think we actually have a name for it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, excellent. So we're gonna move on. Go ahead, if it's quick, is it quick? Yeah. Okay. How long does the anti-hash stay on the system? It stays on, it stays in LSAS memory uh, until the user logs out. The one caveat to that is prior to Windows 8.1 and the new update, it may linger if an application doesn't close properly until reboot. But normally it's the user session duration and worst case is the reboot. So yeah, we got about 10 slides we gotta move. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna run through some of these a little faster because I, I think the questions are better than, um, and you guys can always pull the slides afterwards. Um, so some of the things like I talked about that we try to do in the Red Forest is try to make it self-maintaining uh, using WSUS to automatically patch uh, the different roles that are inside of there. We went as small as we could get it, right? A couple domain controllers for high availability, um, ops manager for the alerting, and then admin workstations. Um, of course, customers can expand on that if they wanna have other roles inside of there. Um, and we also enforce smart cards in that environment, and we have a script that we created to actually uh, check and uncheck that box so that it cycles that, that hash uh, to be recreated every night for admins, right? Which, by the way, is interesting. Uh, does anybody cycle that hash at all? 
So one, two. Okay, so if you don't know and you do go look at doing this in a production network, um, if you cycle that hash and users have sessions open, you will lock all their accounts out. Uh, we had a customer do this to all of their accounts in Active Directory on a, on a night and the next morning came in and had 35,000 help desk calls. <laughs> Uh, my account is locked out, I can no longer log in. Um, you have to do this when the user logs out. So we definitely recommend cycling that for admins because typically admins should be enforced to log out every night so that you can do this. Uh, users sometimes leave their accounts you know, logged in overnight and it's a little harder to do with users. Um, another interesting thing is uh, customers say, well what if I have multiple forests and multiple domains? Uh, we can use this admin environment to, to manage n number of domains or forests. And uh, we've had some customers do dedicated card per domain because they wanted the separation. Other customers have one card with multiple roles on that card. And so in Windows and in most smart cards today, .NET cards, Jamalto cards, um, you can support multiple certificates on there. Um, of course, they all use the same pin, but you can then pick your user from the from the certificates that are loaded on that smart card based on what role you're gonna execute as. And we do recommend having a separate account per managed domain so that if, ever, if any domain ever is knocked over, then the hash and the credential that they have from there is not good in the other managed domains. So we do recommend at least at that account level that there is separation, even if they're mapped to the same smart card and cert. So, the other thing that, of course, you know, this addresses all the ESAE stuff that you saw, um, addresses the domain and forest administration really well. Um, when it came to uh, integrating various other different applications, the administration of them, um, we found that a lot of applications don't like to be managed across a forest trust, a one-way forest trust, no less. Um, they just simply have issues. They want to bring up um, a list of, uh, of accounts from that domain in their own way. So we ran into a number of issues there. And so what we found is that instead of using the admin forest for everything, it was better to put an admin workstation, a privileged account workstation, into the production environment and have that as the dedicated known good workstation for managing the servers and applications and the, the help desk sessions as well. Um, this becomes a lot more interesting and important now that we have RDP with remote admin, uh, excuse me, with restricted admin mode, um, where we don't expose the credentials on the far end. It becomes important now for help desk uh, workstations that have control over the entire workstation tier that those guys have a dedicated workstation as well because you can now differentiate where the admin accounts go and where they don't go. So. Um, ultimately, it's, it's focused on both enterprise threats and those known internet threats. Um, we do not allow the admin uh, workstations to access the internet directly. We do allow RDP down to uh, a user desktop, a user VDI, a user uh, RDP session, a user VM. But again, you have to start at high trust and then go to low trust for the user functions. You cannot gain security by RDPing up because the attacker can follow that same elevation of privilege path. Just to point out to answer the gentleman's question earlier, um, exactly what Mark was saying, our, our theory is it's okay to reach from a high security environment to a lower security environment with the right controls in place, right? And the reason I say that is if I have this and this is my regular user workstation, I'm browsing the internet and then I pop open my admin VM and there's malware on here, well guess what, that malware has access to my admin VM. Or if I remote to another server uh, as an admin, even though my admin's not on here, it could theoretically hijack that session um, and use that session as an admin, right? And, and do things, or just screen scrape what I'm doing. Watch me type in things inside the network, all kinds of different uh, things they can do. But if this was a secure admin workstation that doesn't have internet access, my, my risks are greatly reduced because I don't have that, that internet connectivity, then I could reach out to a user session because I can trust this host is not compromised, right? Because we've reduced the risk on it. And the assumption that we operate on is that if a tool can be written to exploit something, it will be. If you take a look at uh, Windows 8.1 Preview, it came out and we started doing some of those changes that uh, Mark Rosinovich talked about in his talk, which we'll briefly cover here. Within a week, I can't remember, it was a certain number of days, Mimikatz was updated and he had discovered the changes we made and he had already figured out what we had done, within days. So we pretty much assume if a tool can be built, it will be built. It's the only safe assumption in this world. You have to adhere to the security principles. You speed it up. 
So this is pretty much the same thing as those hardened workstations that are in ESAE. It's just simply extracted out of there and put into the production forest. You can use this for domain admins in a production forest. However, it will not increase the trust level of your current production forest. An admin forest will because it can uh, essentially outsource a lot of those admin functions to it and kind of have that halo effect of additional assurances and additional levels of insurance. But this is always 100% and completely dependent on the domain it's joined to. So the security of the workstation cannot increase the, the security of the domain through that way. And of course, we do recommend the smart cards for these as well in the password cycling. The other thing that we, we started to understand is you also need trusted admin hosts for some other business critical functions. One is we have cloud infrastructure out there now that is running business critical stuff. And we don't want to be going to that cloud infrastructure on just any internet browsing workstation that has all of these risks of infection and risks of browsing and phishing emails associated with it, especially if it's a high impact you know, we have our, our business critical app up on uh, Azure IaaS or Amazon Web Services or, or whatever it happens to be. You want to make sure if you're doing administration work and control of that infrastructure that you're doing it from a known good trusted host. Additionally, social media sometimes is a critical business asset. If someone's Twitter account gets hacked, if their Facebook account gets hacked for the corporate one, it's an embarrassment to the company. It's something they want to avoid. Um, so we have the ability to essentially narrow the scope and say that these workstations will only touch that part of the internet. So it becomes much more like it's a hosted service by a third party rather than a broad cloud-based approach, if that well, makes sense. So we most just people don't think about those social media sites. I mean, look at the, the AP Press uh, or New York Press or whatever got hacked. Uh, their Twitter account got hacked. Somebody posted something, and all of a sudden the stock market crashed. Look at the effect of one tweet that you know, because that, that account that was used to manage that social media brand uh, was attacked. Yep. So very much the same types of protections. We start with the known good because you have to have good media going into it, which we'll talk about in just a moment. We have a slide on that. Uh, smart cards are, of course, recommended. We do have 20 plus security controls, which we list in the next slide. And of course, we always recommend security alerting. If something unusual or anomalous happens, on these workstations or to them, because it's a very fixed function workstation, you should get an alert and you should be investigating that to see if it's an actual attack or not. These are the 20 controls. I am not going to read them all. We want to save you time for, for questions. You can always read these afterwards. Mm -hmm. so. Ultimately, the intent of this is we start from those that known good media, and we want this to stay a known good workstation. And so we limit all of the points of risk that we are able to. And this is pretty much the laundry list of all the Microsoft technology, security technology. <laughs> we'll give you a couple more seconds for photos, because I see people taking photos. And yes, you have to use system center endpoint protection. <laughs> Hands down. <laughs> Question. That is correct. Yep. It will be posted in the normal process. OK. Want to take Mars? Sure. So as Mark said with the slide we had earlier, right? you want to limit where the credential can be used, and you want to limit, if you can't limit this where it's at, how long it can be used. right? So one of the things we built was what we call managed access request system um, off of a FIM workflow, Forefront Identity Manager uh, workflow, so that administrators can have time bomb credentials. Right, so that they're not administrator all day long. That's how you limit their usefulness. right? I have a help desk team that comes in and probably works a shift. Do they need, does their account need to be admin 24 hours a day? They're only there for eight or 12 hours a day or how many ever hours their shift is. Those other hours, they shouldn't be uh, administrators, so now you're limiting the usefulness of their credential, right? So kind of what, we, what this looks like is, you know, come in, you request access. Hey, I got to make this change at 10 a.m. Um, it could be auto-approved. It could have somebody... Uh, have to actually approve it. Let's say you have a contractor or a vendor. And this could be any time span, right? So let's say you have somebody coming on site for six months and you only want their, their admin account to be available. Um, an email notification goes out, auditing all that great logging. The candidate account accesses the resources at 10.01. That is, account has been granted access, does whatever he needs to do, uh, or she. And then the privilege expires at noon. And then that account goes to log in again at 3.15. 
and that login is denied because they have no longer have administrative rights. So this is kind of how you achieve, um, we did it with FIM, there's some other tools available from partner companies that kind of do the same thing, um, but this is really the kind of the next space to go with admin credentials of how do we limit how useful they are by limiting how long they're actually useful. And this really builds on that trust of that, um, of that workstation that you have a known good place to start the session from. And this just gives you that great extra protective controls as well as detective controls because you know if someone's trying to use it because you all of a sudden know when they were supposed to be authorized. Because right now it's very difficult to know when someone was supposed to do any given task. In this case, they have to go through a, a mother may I process so we have that record. And it can be an easy visit the website, click, click, I've got the privileges, and then I've got it for two, four, eight, 12, 24 hours. And you know that they went and asked for that. And so you have a lot better view into what the admins, quote, should be doing. And kind of some, some key features we think of doing something like this is you definitely need to have uh, some custom actions to support those different roles, approval requirements, and notification, right? You want to be able to log all this and you want to be able to notify people as, as they attempt to access or, or, ac or asking for access. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the new features that uh, came out of some of the work that uh, I was involved with in the, the, as part of the Pass the Hash working group where a lot of these changes were driven into the product, which there's a full session by uh, Mark uh, Rosinovich and Nathan Ide on this. Um, so check out that recording if you, if you didn't attend that. Um, but ultimately, there's a lot of stuff around just cleaning up stuff that's not necessary, LM hashes, plain text equivalents from that LSAS memory. It's simply not there. Um, of course, a keylogger could steal, still steal it, um, but this does reduce that footprint significantly. Um, enforcing credential removal after log off, it ends that lingering credential problem. We're no longer polite to an application. If the user said log out, sorry, the cred's gone. It's, it's out of there. And of course, making that uh, mitigation too a lot easier for restricting those logon rights, um, as, uh, as Mark and Nathan demoed. And then there's some, some of those new features like protected users is a Kerberos only account and only the high security authentication of Kerberos. And then uh, the authentication policies in silos builds on that. They're, they're Kerberos policies that allow you to really restrict where an account may log in. So if it is not a, TG, the TGT will not be issued, even with the legitimate creden, the credentials, if they're not on one of the authorized machines where it should be there. So some amazing controls if you can get to an NTLM free world um, by going to protected users. And then the last piece there is that restricted admin mode for remote desktop. Very, very powerful because it allows you to have a full functioning RDP session on the remote end without exposing the credentials to the remote end. You get a full interactive desktop, you get all the clicks, et cetera. So if you leave the session early, that's okay, but you're not gonna get to see the very last slide which has the real deal information on it. So I recommend you hang around, so. Nice pressure. So what, is this, what does this all look like when you add it all up, right? Uh, a, very complex. Um, but it really creates a strategy and an architecture to really protect credentials against theft inside of an Active Directory environment or a Windows network, right? So when you layer in that first thing with user rights and preventing the, the privilege escalation in tiers, right? And then you add in lateral traversal mitigations, randomizing your local administrator accounts, doing those things so that uh, admins aren't local admins on all boxes or have a service account that's a local admin on all boxes. Add in application and service hardening. Look at those applications and determine what what rights do they really have to that higher tier? For example, SECM being able to push anything it wants to a domain controller. To include malware. Um, and I, I've actually seen a red team use operations manager uh, to push tools to boxes. So it does happen. Yeah, and we've seen all forms of applications used. We've seen the applications service account used. We've seen the application itself used. We have seen all variations of this in some form or fashion in the wild. And when you add in enhanced security admin environment to protect those domain admins, and then you take your other tiered administrators and add in the privileged account workstation, manage access requests so that their credentials aren't uh, full admins 24 by seven when they don't need to be, because they only work on a, a certain period of time per day. Layer on top of that, the new 8.1 features, restricted R RDP, so when those help desk admins reach out and RDP to a user workstation, they're not exposing those admin credentials that do have access across that whole workstation tier to you know, enforcing protected users and authentication silos uh, with 
uh, your admins at your different tiers, right? So now you've created a, a, an architecture to really protect, protect your admin accounts from credential theft. And this creates an extremely frustrating environment for an attacker to attack. So the last two pieces um, are kind of a little bit of, of the how we do these, how we built these solutions, as well as what we look for when we do that hardening to look at the service accounts. So the, the first one here is, is, is our application service hardening. It's not quite a methodology, but we're working on that. Ultimately, any given application, we look at what is the downstream control? What can this application control? Does it have agents on DCs? Does it have agents on other servers? Does it have a service account that is administrator in every local workstation because we're going to be pushing agents with this particular account? What, is, what, what does it control? What credentials does it have? What agents does it, does it have under its control? And in the case of a domain, ultimately it's everything, and that's just kind of the default. So if you look at a domain as an application, the domain controls everything. It controls tier zero, tier one, tier two, it holds the boundaries on them, and how you configure it determines you know, that security level. Now we look at the upstream risks. So the first part is kind of like your standard stuff. Make sure it's patched, because an unpatched software vulnerability, as if you guys saw any of the hacking sessions, if it's unpatched, it's a free exploit, it's probably already in Metasploit, and it's just something that's available on the menu for the attackers to attack you with. If it is not a patched, if the vulnerability is there and the patch is not applied, then you're not even making the attacker develop their own tools, you're not making them buy a zero day, they're just able to do it with freely available stuff. So staying patched and making sure that you're following the SCM guidelines for the uh, OS configuration, the app configuration, that's kind of like just the basics of hardening that's been around forever. The other things that we look at is what are the management agents and, of course, scheduled tasks that are on that server and, and, and running? What are the things that can control the, the host under it or the application itself? Whoever is the local administrator, anybody in that group, of course, controls the host, the application, and anything it controls, including all the data on the host and all the downstream uh, controlled machines. Backups. If I, as an attacker, can get a backup of your server, I can extract the local administrator NT hash file out of it, log on to the live copy of it, and I own that box and everything on it and everything it controls on downstream. Same thing with the storage administrator. If I own the SAN where your VMDK or VHDX or um, your backups are stored, I own you. Baseboard management controllers. A little bit more interruptive, but ultimately, if I control your DRAC, your HP ILO, I can't remember the IBM acronym, um, if I control you at the hardware layer, I control your operating system, the apps on it, and everything downstream. And how many people actually patch those? Good. Can you guys go work at some of my other customers? Please. <laughs> Physical access. If I go in and I have access to the physical ports, I can do DMA attacks and all sorts of things where you simply just plug in a device, boom, you're in the memory, you're able to do things to take control of that operating system and go on out. Virtual machine administrator, same thing. If I virtualize a DC, I have just promoted my virtualization admins to domain admins because they have full control of that DC, that hard drive. They can take the NTDS DIT file out, including the secrets used to encrypt it from uh, that virtual machine console and extract those out and they own the domain, well, there's a number of different ways. They can also simply boot it off of a hacker ISO, a copy of it. If, I'm a, if I own the virtualization infrastructure you're hosted on, I own you. There's a number of ways through Active Directory where fundamentally if I can run a GPO and have a script run as a startup script as system, I own it. So we always look for those angles as well. And of course, the initial media. If I can infect the whim that you installed your DC with and then you promote it to a DC, I own the domain and everything in it. And depending on the application, uh, so for example, if you have a backup server with three or four different types of roles, one of which can arbitrarily restore the server to anywhere, that one tends to have full control, where if someone can only initiate an existing backup but not access the backup file, that doesn't have full control. So depending on the application and how it's designed, you may also have roles that have application admin rights that can also exert control. So these are the things that we look for when we do hardening. Questions?
And thank you for going to the mic. So we have uh, um, identity management solution. Um, and it requires an account that is a user admin account. We had to also elevate its rights to be able to change passwords on all the users. So it sets the passwords for all the users. So this identity management solution is what, uh, it's a um, well-known product, I won't mention it, but um, it's not a Microsoft one. But anyhow. Um, well, there's your problem. No. <laughs> so how would we, uh, I'm not sure how to defend against that because this, uh, this, this application is outside of the domain. Um, it uses a domain account. Can I put this account within that, that uh, secure domain so, and somehow mitigate it? Or, I'm, so, so the way we view an application like that is the first thing we ask ourselves is where is it now de facto in the tier model? Is it a tier zero? Does it effectively, is it able to control only user accounts or is it able to control admin, server admin, workstation admin, and user accounts? And so we classify its influence there. Then we ask ourselves, okay, if it is a tier zero, does it need to be or does it really only manage user passwords so we just simply delegate the rights out so it can only reset those accounts? And if you can demote it out of there and take it out of your tier zero priority, you can then move on to the next tier zero app. So that's how we approach that piece. Um, it's, and it's really the control it has over the environment we worry about more so than the placement of it. Um, the placement of it is sort of the, okay, it's a tier zero, we can't avoid it. How do we secure it? Will it work in an admin forest? Will it not? Do, we got to make sure it has admin desktops that are used to manage it. You know, we have to look at all those pieces as we look at the app architecture. So I got you. Just hold it though. We got two more slides yep. and uh, we got eight minutes left. And so I uh, want to make sure we just cover them. Um, so the importance of no good media, right? Just like I talked about, it is super easy to mount a whim and to drop some files into that whim and then you just go lay that on all your images and now I have admin, right, if I'm an attacker. It's super important, especially around admin workstations and uh, if, as you move to this model to use known good media, right? So there's a couple ways you can do it. You can get the DVD printed media from the manufacturer. You can, you know, typically that's pretty good media you can trust. Of course, supply chain interdiction and things like that can happen as we're seeing in the news. Um, one of the things we like to do is uh, what we call the double download. Uh, we download it on two different workstations, verify the hash matches on both of them, and verify that it matches with whatever the vendor put that the hash is, right? Ensure those things line up. So and if the vendor provides the hashes, use those. Because yeah. that's, that's their, you know, basically their signature on it. But if you can't do that or they don't provide it, two different internet connections, two different hosts, so it will be very difficult for an attacker to make the exact same injection on both and then you do the comparison. So two independent pieces and make sure that that hasn't been tampered with, which is sometimes the best you can do. So some lessons learned, right? It's, uh, it's, this is not something you can just patch. We can't, we can't just put out a patch and fix it everywhere. Uh, it's built into the OS. It's not technically a vulnerability. Um, it, it's all about changing how we operate and uh, do administration procedures within our environments. Um, as we stated with the, the VM situation, it all starts with host integrity, right? If I, can, if I can't trust the host, then I can't trust the admins on it. I can't trust that the credentials haven't been stolen. You have to have a secure integ uh, host that's, that has some integrity behind it. Um, and obviously, prevention is uh, obviously way cheaper than recovery, way cheaper. Um, some of the customers we are working with now are uh, doing what we call a greenfield, rebuild my entire network next to the one that's uh, now compromised. Um, domain admin compromise. Lots of money, lots of time, uh, and it's a headache, a headache. So uh, we do have our emails in there. They'll be in the slide decks. Feel free to contact us, uh, and we'll open it up to some questions. Uh, the first couple questions get swag, because we have a couple left. And he, he had his hand up first, so I'll go ahead and give it to him. Uh, this question is more uh, geared towards how Kerberos functions. Uh, one of the fundamental issues with a Kerberos token is once you're logged in, there's no way to kick them out, right? So even if I disable the account, if I'm a local admin, as long as my token is active, right, I can do a lot of damage. What's Microsoft doing to address that? So uh, the, good question. The, the we, still new... have, we still have the last slide that you'll get to see that has awesome stuff on it for those that are leaving. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. 
<laughs> the, uh, so the, the, the sessions being still good is always tricky because the Windows sessions will always be good until they log out. And of course, the credentials themselves have to expire out. The, um, the thing about Kerberos is that you can limit the lifetime. If you put them in protected users, by default, it's, I want to say, four hours that the TGTs are good for, non-renewable. Right. Yep. Authentication policies allow you to dial that down even further or dial that up. So if you, you have to get to Kerberos only to, to make that effective. Actually, that one you could leave NTLM working, but you know, then you have NTLM risks even though you've addressed Kerberos. So you really need to be as You're only minimizing users. the window, though. The problem still exists. Yeah. Right. Correct. Time bounding reduces risk, but it does not eliminate it. OK. So um, we're using uh, vulnerability scanning. We're local, um, local scanning across our enterprise. Yep. Um, using the service account so we have that local access because if we randomized our local passwords, we would not be able to manage that way. Um, we just recently introduced um, a process where after we uh, complete our scan window, we actually change our admin password for um, the scanner. But short of that, what other options are you guys looking at? Would something like the restricted groups or something like that that are coming out now so be I would, a viable option? I would talk to the vendor and demand that they support multiple service accounts, right? Okay. So if you could have multiple service accounts where, and I've seen some of the tools that do this, where you can say, this is my workstation tier, and you know that credential is useful across there. We assume that the workstation tier is going to get compromised. Yeah. You're going to get some broad-based malware. You're going to get something somewhere, right? But as long as that credential can't be used on a higher level, does it really matter? I mean, it matters that maybe they could get the data from the user, but they don't own your entire network, right? So you still want to look out for those things. I'm not saying it's not important, but in the order of priority, I would prefer that they don't own my entire network and that maybe they get just that tier. Yeah, right? I mean, this is a journey that we're starting on. The first piece is to contain the damage to the, to the, to the you know, big bucket and to the smallest big bucket we can. And the next piece is let's look at your high value data and let's narrow the access to that and get really focused on that. I mean, this is the start of a, a new journey because, frankly, the attackers have leapfrogged in capability well beyond the defenders right now. So we got one more. I see three questions. Uh, and, and this one here. And it's super sunny outside, apparently. But you're all in here listening to our awesome session, so you may need these. Can, can you go to the mic? It's really hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Have the platform update been released? And if not, when is it getting released? Uh, for the updates back to Windows 7? There was a bulletin that was released with the patch Tuesday this week um, that has details on the updates that were backported. Um, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head. It's about seven digits. But that update does have the details of what was uh, just released. OK. And how much will it mitigate the problems posed by the attack? Uh, it will do a lot to mitigate them, uh, but ultimately uh, a trusted and a known good high integrity host is really under your control to establish that. Thank it, you. It's not a problem solver. You can't, you can't just deploy the patch and be done. You still have to change your operational practices. Thank you. Yep. It makes it easier to do the right thing. It does not automate it. So with the restricted admin RDP, I mean, assuming it gets backported since we won't be on 8.1 for a while, but I, can you enforce that? those uh, accounts can on only use restricted admin, or we still have to guarantee that all your you know, tier one unreliable help desk people are going to check those options? Yes, you can enforce it at the client level. So the, the RDP client that's initiating it, you can set a group policy on those machines that all RDP will be RDP with restricted admin on those machines. So you would have target their, their admin workstations that they're using to reach out to those clients and force it there. OK, and so I guess then you can just restrict the accounts to only log. All right, cool. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. If you're connecting to a, another machine using computer management connecting to it uh, to like change a password or, or add a, another admin or something to it, does that um, make your, your account you're using visible to the pass the hash? Generally, the MMCs are using only a network logon, which is just an authenticated connection. It doesn't actually run a process on the other end. So for the, for the general rule is it doesn't expose a cred, but I would recommend testing it looking at the event log and seeing in the logon event, was it a logon type 3, type 5, type 2, you know, and see if it isn't, in fact, a network logon. And look at the white paper. We cover a lot of the tools that, that tell you what type of logon it is when you use that tool. Yeah, that's covered in the white paper. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. They were, they were up there. Go ahead. Uh, for the red card forest, um, you only mentioned smart card authentication, but are, are there other forms of two-factor authentication that would work equally as well? Sure. Anything that works in Windows. 
Yeah, we've, we've integrated a couple other different ones, but smart card's the default because it's just smoothly integrated in, uh, in the AD. So th this is, like you said, it's not a uh, vulnerability. This is just a, a part of the operating system that they are able to take advantage of. Long term, how are they going to solve this? Is it getting rid of NTLM is going to be the only solution, or this is the new world? Uh, this, this is the world. They figured out, you know, how to do the things that we do natively. Um, I think as NTLM goes away, it will make it easier for them to have to go do something else, but we've already seen uh, past the ticket attacks. Um, not wildly, you know, more of in the lab environment, people were showing how they could do it um, and be able to steal a Kerberos ticket and then act as you, and that, that's kind of what his question was going on, how do you shorten that lifetime of the ticket? Um, but unfortunately, unless, I mean, I, I don't know about you, I like logging on once in the morning uh, with my smart card or my TPM uh, virtual smart card and not having to type in my password 50 times besides Outlook, which for some reason doesn't ever like to use my password. Um, so, and to, to me, it, it's a lot easier, right? And, and that's what the user experience is all about. And it's not a Windows operating system only that does this. Any operating system does this, right? So that you don't get prompted for a password every time you do something. Yeah, ultimately, this is the new world, and it's the same as the old world. We just never had to worry about it. If you look back to the days of mainframe, a, key logger could have, a keystroke logger could have done the same thing. So the principle hasn't changed at all in all the time we've been doing computing. Um, the, the key is that the threat level has raised to the point where they're not going after unpatched vulnerabilities as much as they are. They're going after the lowest hanging fruit. And, you know, claims will help, but ultimately, you know, as we get into that world, because you don't have this um, originating authenticator that, that's passed around, but it's still not going to solve the fact that wherever you start your session is always in control of it. So we'll go one more if anybody else wants, but uh, we're eventually going to get kicked out. So, uh, were you waiting for a question, sir? I, I don't want to skip you because you were standing up there. Well, I guess the only question that I had is, where do you have your Exchange admins living when they have to do their upgrade or install of Exchange? Uh, since typically Exchange is a tier one type server application, right? It doesn't require domain admin privileges or, or other than read, reading some things and, and doing some things with the domain controller. Uh, it, most of the time it's tier one, right? When you go to do that schema upgrade, then you may have to use that break glass account to be able to do that one, one time thing. Uh, and you would recommend doing it on a dedicated host, right? An admin workstation, do the schema upgrade, disable that account again, uh, those types of things, so. And I think with that, we are completely out of time and we thank you very much for your time. Thank you. is no longer the primary and only part of the security strategy. So, so we got some more swag if somebody can answer this question. Typically, and, and this is based on our experience with incident response, how many hours does it take to get domain admin after somebody establishes a beachhead, an attacker establishes a beachhead? I saw his hand first. Nope. Nope. On average, across all the attacks in a real enterprise network. Nope. I'll tell you it's higher, a little higher. Higher, higher, higher. He's getting closer. No. A little higher. 48. What was that? No. 48, there it is. Yep. 48 hours. Uh, I'm glad you guys thought it was a lot faster. That's uh, awesome. Uh, we, did, we have seen some cases where they typically uh, doesn't happen that way where they go right into the domain administrator, but typically they target someone that's not there, but they can gain access to domain administrator credentials in typically 48 to 72 hours in most of the incidents response that we do. When we do the forensics and look at the logs, we can see that occur that fast. And pen testers, you know, can do it in as fast as five or six. We have a much better data there than having to crawl through the logs. So this is, uh, this picture here is Mark. Um, mm -hmm. This is what he does on the weekends. But um, this is kind of what past the hash looks like in a nice animated graphic, right? The attacker targets a workstation or a set of workstations. Um, typically, it's not in mass anymore, but in mass to a certain number of users within the organization. Um, and once he sends that in, he gets a foothold on one of those boxes, um, and hopefully that box is someone that has local admin, right? And they compromise that box and harvest that user's credentials, and they use those credentials to actually move to another box on the network. So before we go on, I'd like everybody to close their eyes, because I don't want anybody to see who else is vulnerable. <laughs> And raise your hand if you are using the same admin password across all your workstations. Okay. Thank you. 
By the way, it was about half, but don't point anybody <laughs> out. I'll, I'll point now. I'm just kidding. Um, so typically, they move across across to the next machine, harvest some more credentials. So, hello and welcome. My name is Mark Simos. Nicholas Tacola. And we are both uh, cybersecurity architects on Microsoft cybersecurity team. Um, so we focus, uh, we are in the services organization, so we focus on working with customers um, directly and, uh, and consulting engagements uh, primarily to help them secure against various different cybersecurity attacks, um, including pass the hash, credential theft in its various forms. And I've also uh, had the honor and privilege of uh, co-authoring the Pass the Hash white paper. Um, there's uh, the current one that's out there, as well as we're working on an upcoming version, which uh, Mark Rasinovich mentioned in the other session. Um, so one, one note before we start, if you can go to the mics if you're going to ask a question, please feel free to ask a question any time during the presentation. Um, if you're stuck in the middle, because I know these seats are kind of hard to get out of, uh, we'll try to repeat the question so everybody can hear it, because um, they are recording it so other folks can, can see it live or, or watch it later. So, our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about our cybersecurity team here at Microsoft um, and kind of the things that we do. What, what we classify as a determined adversary and what the targeted attacks look like um, that we're seeing with customers. What is past the hash or credential theft? So this will be a little bit of reiteration of what Mark did in his session. So if you didn't see it, great. If you did see it, it's, it uh, it'll be a rehash of that. And then last, some things you can do and credential theft mitigation architectures in your environments to protect against this, right? And things that we've been helping customers implement um, to actually protect against credential theft. And, and the way to look at these architectures is they're really a reference architecture that we've had to develop based on the information that we get from our incident response teams and what's actually happening on the customer hacks. So it's very much a reference architecture that was built in response to the attacks we're seeing. And we do have a, a pretty cool demo of, of the tools actually uh, using past dash. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about our team, uh, just real quick. Our team uh, is really focused on going out and helping customers uh, through services engagements and delivering all kinds of different things. So we're, the big areas we've kind of focused in are up here on the slide. So sensors and intelligence, how do we- This is a sophisticated, organized type of uh, situation that we're in. Yeah, why, why buy your own development resources uh, when you can just use someone else's? Private cloud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> different cloud, diff different owner, but yeah, and it's free. Um, so one of the things that we typically see, um, probably the biggest thing and the easiest way we can relate this is kind of the castle uh, scenario is kind of the way I think of it. In traditional network architectures, we've treated our networks like, our, like a castle, right? I have a moat, I have a wall, which is my IPS, my firewall, my IDS, all these things kind of on the outside. But inside my network, it's just kind of one big flat network. And I'm not talking IP space, VLANs, those type of things. But from a perspective of a user, I can just reach out and touch a share. You know, not a lot of customers do IPsec or network segmentation. They may have line of business applications that they, they break off into a separate area and protect that way. Um, but typically, in most Windows environments, what we see is customers just have kind of one big flat Windows architecture, right? Maybe a couple domains, maybe one forest um, with those domains. And typically, when they do that, they treat a lot of resources equally, right? They don't say, well, this is my line of business application that runs our business, and we're going to put a higher security baseline on that than we may on these other systems. We typically have one baseline that we use across all those systems, right? And that includes the same systems that the administrators are using, right? Their workstations that they log into, that they check email on, that they open MMC and do management of the different servers or services on their network. And so, um, Typically, it's what we've seen in most networks. So what we want to try to do is help customers get past that castle, castle wall mentality and think about putting some interior walls and doors inside their network where they can protect against things, especially around credential theft. And especially as you look at the kind of four Gartner mega trends with the social, mobile, um, analytics, and uh, cloud, all those pieces are contributing to essentially the erosion of that uh, perimeter because the re corporate resources are going outside of the traditional corporate land boundary. And at the same time, you know, the attackers are getting adept at coming in and compromising any given workstation through phishing attacks and the like. And so that perimeter is really, really, um, it, it's a part of a security strategy, but it is. We're writing denial of service scripts. Um, these are actual funded organizations that have full-time employees doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. 
right? That's what they do for their job every day. Meanwhile, we come in for eight hours a day and try to combat them, right? Um, and pretty much in every incident response that we've seen, there has been some use of credential theft, almost every time. Very, very one or two cases where we didn't actually see that. But once they've come in and that, that way either works through some type of spear fish or they find an application uh, zero day that they get in, but once they're in, pass the hash, that's the way they go. Um, and typically what the attacks look like once we start doing our investigation is they typically get in, they go after Active Directory as fast as possible, right? Because if I own Active Directory, I own all your passwords, I own all your user accounts, I can gain access to anything. They typically drop some malware on the hosts, um, and we have seen in some cases where they've actually tested their malware against the customer's AV signature sets and different tools that the customer has, IDS, IPS. Um, so they actually had notes in there saying, yep, tested against signature set from McAfee at this date. Um, so they knew that it would work in the customer environment. And then typically, 99% of the time, they try to basically exfil data from that customer. That's their goal, get as much data as possible. Um, we have seen in less than 1% of cases uh, what we like to call the wrecking ball, right? They've actually come in and maliciously uh, wiped computers, um, like they talked about in Mark's session, Saudi Aramco. Um, we've had a, a couple other customers that their SAN just started deleting files while they were on the network working. So, uh, and that's kind of how they found out as the SAN was being wiped. Yep, and we've also seen a lot of extremely sophisticated indicators of organization. Um, some of our colleagues uh, observed in one case they actually saw a bunch of computers with very high processor usage. They looked at them, it was about 10, 12 computers, and they dug through and dug through and dug through and figured out what was going on. There was a, they were cracking password hashes. They looked a little closer and they were actually cracking the same password hash. And so it, it took a little bit of a moment, but they finally figured out they were actually conducting a class on their network. The attackers were teaching other attackers using their network as a lab. This stuff really happens. They detect threats within the network uh, that you have today, and then we take what we learn from that and help customers when we do an in, uh, incident response. So we've had a lot of customers that have been compromised that call us in and say, hey, I'm a 90% Windows shop. How, do you, how can I respond to this compromise? What, what's the best practice? So we help them work through all that recovery um, and mitigation. And then we take all those lessons learned from those first two and kind of what can we do to help customers mitigate these current threats, right? So today it's past the hash is one of the big ones, right? Application vulnerabilities, um, things like that. But in the future, that's gonna change and we're probably gonna change what we come up with and architectures that we deliver as more people adapt to these things and the attackers have to move on to something else, right? Um, typical helping customers with architecture and advisory um, and SDL, how do they implement SDL and protect their applications that they're developing in-house? Um, as well as uh, we have a lot of technology experts that came from the product group on working on things like uh, direct access, MBAM, and BitLocker, and a lot of those built-in kind of out-of-the-box features, security features of Windows. Yep. And the only thing I would add there is that we do actually have on-site incident response teams and that's where we get a lot of our intelligence on what's happening on the attacks, is we do help our customers when they do have a compromise or an attack underway. Um, so that's, that's primarily the source of where we uh, develop the requirements for this architecture. Yeah, so as Mark said with our team, th these are the kind of trends that we're seeing and the learnings that we see in an incident response, right? It's, it's super easy uh, to, to get an attack in, and once you're in, use this past the hash credential theft to quickly escalate or laterally traverse across the network in a lot of the Microsoft architectures that are out there today. So as an attacker, if I can just get one, one beachhead into your network, then I can just use this technique and it's very easy. The tools are readily available, the source code's readily available. They can package that up and put it in their own toolkits and do this very easily, right? So we wanna help customers stop credential theft um, and mitigate it in their architecture so that the attackers have to use something else. So they have to step up their game and go to that next level. Um, what we found is, and this is obvious uh, to anybody if you're in the security realm and you're in this room because you're in the security realm, the adversary has grown in maturity tremendously, right? These aren't kids in their basement anymore.